Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. I'm very happy to have with me today Sister Renee Rowland, and I'd like to interview her today. Uh, maybe I'll learn some new things about her, and I'm sure that the viewing audience will learn some new things. So let's try to uh, better understand Sister Renee Rowland and her ministry. Uh, why don't you just say hi before we get started with my questions? Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me, Brother Luke. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to hearing the questions. I have no idea what you're going to ask me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I uh, uh, I have conducted interviews uh, from a few other uh, YouTube saints. Uh, the people that, you know, I greatly admire their YouTube ministry work. And uh, the first one I did was Brother uh, Jack Smack 7-7. And then I did uh, uh, Dr. Brother Jason Jack. And then I made a policy that all future interviews, you must have uh, in your name, the name Jack to be able eligible. <laughs> but Brother Bill. I don't know Jack. So you, that's me. I don't know Jack. So I, I can be included. <laughs> oh, that was funny. I don't know Jack. I think I, I get the joke too. <laughs> I hope everybody gets that. <laughs> Um, and then I interviewed Brother Bill Cuthbert. Uh, I made an exception for him. He he's not named Jack. Uh, uh, and and, um, and now I'm very very happy that I have an opportunity to interview you, Sister. Um, I've, I've watched a lot of your videos. Many of the people on YouTube have greatly benefited from all your videos on YouTube, uh, and, and all the all of your Christian, basically evangelical efforts here on, on YouTube. Um, but I'd like to go back to the beginning here and let's, let's get to know you a little bit better here. So I know you're probably, you're only around 30 years old. Or, so let's go back around back 30 years to your, your birth, your, your, uh, your upbringing. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your family, how you grew up. I'm actually almost 50 years old. <laughs> I was born in 70, so I'm 48 this year. But thank you. That's very sweet. Uh, well, I grew up in the South, uh, right near Virginia. I'm turning my phone off. Uh, right near Virginia Beach. And then I, uh, um, after I graduated, I ran. I was the youngest female executive in the corporation. It was the Warworth Corporation in New York. So I ran a, one of their stores at the age of 19 and was given a bunch of awards. They sent me to the Caribbean. Uh, I got manager of the year a couple years. Uh, you know, did very well. And then I, I just, I wanted, I, I was always an artist, like a, a like a portrait artist. I could do a lot of art, not a lot of money in that. So uh, I took my managerial skills and went out to Hollywood and I started working in, um, in the movie industry, low levels, doing uh, costuming and wardrobe work. Uh, I would take any job. I, I remember working 22 hour day for $60 on Roger Corman. Remember Roger Corman with all his low budget movies? Uh, so uh, I just worked my way up and then I took my managerial skills and applied it. And I saw there was a lot of scummy people. And I was like, uh, I, I got my Screen Actors Guild card. I performed because when I was young, I did all the arts. You know, I did theater and art, um, except music. I'm a horrible singer. My mom and sister have that talent. I That gene skipped me. But like you, I wasn't thrown out of course, though. You got me beat. Um, so I went there and I just started raising my own funds. Uh, and found out I was really good at managing movie productions. So I was hired as line producer. A couple of my films were picked up by Lionsgate. And uh, I lived a crazy celebrity infested lifestyle and had the most amazing creative people in my life. But I also had a lot of insanity, debauchery um, at the right before Court. I don't like to drop names because I don't tell you I work this and I know what I couldn't even name it because it's just what I did. Like if I was a doctor, I'd work with other doctors. So I would just happen to work with people that other people consider celebrity. Um, but right before Corey Haim died, 
he was living with me. And uh, I was also in the throes of addiction. And although myself and a few celebrity actors got together to raise money for him to go to Betty Ford, I took him there and three days later, they're calling me because he kept calling me to pick him up. I'm quitting. I said, you've been there two days. So I wouldn't pick him up. But they called me and said that they had tossed him out. So he stayed with me and I saw that poor boy just devastated by, you know, celebrity loss of it and addiction. And I started looking at myself and how crazy my life was. And I got really, really deep into it. And right before I came back here, uh, I was in a very dangerous place. I mean, I'd go down to Skid Row at 3 a.m. on the subway by myself and cop dope and shoot heroin right there in a tent with the homeless people. And um, I ended up losing everything because a couple of guys saw me walking down the road and abducted me, threw me in the back of a car, drug me broad daylight, a yard full of guys. It was right outside the ghetto. It was right near Compton, right outside of Compton. It wasn't Skid Row. I, it, this was actually over closer to Inglewood area. And I was meeting a girlfriend there. And a uh, guy gets out of the car, picks me by my hair, drags me across the whole street. And I'm screaming, dial 911. And the guys in the yard go, get that hoe in the car. Nobody would help me. And uh, so I had to fight. Well, on the way in there, I got gravel all over my back. My shirt was ripped open. And you can see the scars here, which Christians seem to yeah, have scars. They say the meanest thing sometimes. I don't understand. Atheists don't do that to me. They might pick on me and I joke back, but they, they're not cruel. But they, he took me by the back and smashed my face into the corner of the car. So in the process of this big fight, uh, I don't know if you can see all the wounds on my arms and stuff. Uh, I got MRSA, that back, the flesh-eating bacteria. And uh, one of the guys that had done it to me were uh, in jail. They got it in prison. So I, I fought my way out. I kicked the guy in the throat and fell out of the back seat. And there was a cop, two cars behind me in the other lane, thank God. So he jumped out when he saw my face covered in blood and no shirt on this side of my body. And they got out on foot and ran. Uh, and I survived. But the problem was this. The MRSA got into my bloodstream. It shut down my kidneys. And I was septic. So I was literally on my deathbed. And for two years, I fought to find out what was wrong with me. And... Um, I was in and out of hospitals in a wheelchair because eventually it got into my bones. It ate, I had osteomyelitis. It ate the cartilage in my sacroiliac joint and went to every part of my body. And when I say I had no kidney function, I was in complete failure. I could smell ammonia on my mouth. I was having hallucinations. It was just horrible. But a couple of guys came into my hospital room that I never met, prayed over me two hours before dialysis. Kidneys began functioning all by themselves. So I know that God does heal. Uh, and when it says, lay your hands on them and pray over them, the elders, you will recover. I've seen it happen. Um, so that's why I'm in the disabled state that I am. Although I walk now, I'm able to walk with no cartilage in my right hip. And uh, it's getting better all the time. Last year, I had some issues, you know, I was trying to get an MRI and everything because I thought it was coming back, the infection, because the pain got so severe. But that that eventually went away, too. So that, that's why, where I am in the history. That's it in a nutshell. I kind of condensed 20 years. Yeah, I was just about to say, I asked you about your childhood, and you gave me like 20 or 30 years. Now, of life. That's where I am. <laughs> then but, I had my kid. Now I, <laughs> I'd like to back up again. I mean, that yeah. was, uh, I think that was very important. Uh, that everybody understand all these events because how that's affected you. It, it, it affects who you are. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I'm curious about is you said you were born and raised in the South. 
Yeah. In your home life growing up as a child, was it a Christian family or a oh, secular yeah. or, or what What kind of upbringing did you have? Just re- I got a lot of questions. So mm-hmm. one of these a little bit shorter because I got a, or I just won't get to more got questions. It. All right. Uh, when I was growing up, my mom was Christian. My dad was Christian, didn't go to church. I mean, it was just understood. We, you know, knew Jesus was God. Um, but it, my grandma was very Christian. I, I didn't remain in that, though, when I got older. I never could leave Jesus, though. I always loved him. I just wasn't clear on the gospel. So I wasn't sure if I was saved as a child and just fell away. Um, and then God brought me back because he really did some amazing things for me while I was out there in all that mess. So I, I don't think he ever left me. So I don't know if I was really saved as a child and just came back as a prodigal son or if I really got saved about 11 years ago when I get the, the full revelation of the gospel. But I grew up in the faith, left it and went into the new age and a cult, you know, which is so popular in Los Angeles. Because I had a wrong understanding of Christianity. I thought it was about laws. All right. At, at, what, at what age did you leave home and go off to be on your own then? About 17. So, 17. So you moved from the south all the way to California at age 17. That's well, no, I moved, uh, moved to another city on my own and worked for that company for a while mm-hmm. and then moved to L.A. at 21. Okay. All right. So in, in L.A., of course, uh, we know a little bit. Uh, I'm sure, you, you could probably write a book about all the yeah. experiences <laughs> in Hollywood and and your career in Hollywood. Uh, I I want to talk a little bit more about that later. I'm just trying to go a little bit in chronological. Oh, yeah. I gave you the big, broad picture. Now you can ask. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> got a lot of stuff you can ask now. <laughs> so so when you're in Hollywood, though, you uh, I'm guessing now that you um you still had this affection and and um, 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 I don't know how you're going to how you describe it, but but G, uh, for Jesus. But yes, yes. Uh, at the same time, you got involved in all these, uh, you know, uh, mm. other religious uh, uh, propositions, you know, right. new age and, and et cetera. Uh, then there was something something uh, caused you to. Uh, come back to Jesus and, and get, get a full realization of who he is, what he's done for you, and the means of salvation. Could you tell me, well, you, you mentioned 11 years. Was that after uh, all these events that you mentioned earlier? And then uh, and tell me a little bit about that experience, how you came to the understanding about uh, who Jesus is, his his free gift for, of salvation, and, and your your interest in studying the Bible. Remember a little while ago, I was saying, I'm not sure if I was saved as a kid and just quenched the Holy Spirit and then came back because I've always sought. But I I kept nobody could give me answers in L.A. I I would go to these churches and then they couldn't really explain it. Like, I mean, he died for me. So what is that? Why do I have to do this and stop this? sin? because I knew I was in the bondage of heroin and a crazy lifestyle that came with it. And I knew I was in the bondage of that sin and I couldn't stop it. So that meant I couldn't be saved. And that's, you know, where these two slits up my wrist came from. I tried to commit suicide. And that's why I come against it so much. But what happened, interesting, there's a turning point there. I was into the occult and stuff and I and it, there was some bad stuff. I saw some supernatural things and, and just my mind was just messed up. And I remember somebody giving me that Conversations with God book and I was reading through it. But I was hearing another voice say, this is not me. That's not me talking. So that's what makes me feel like the Holy Spirit was always in me. And I just quenched it. You know, I was always saved as a child. Because at some time I believed. But got taught false. That it was law. So I stopped looking to Jesus. And started thinking it was about rules. And I was like, well, I can't keep them. So I got to find another way to be saved. You know, and that's torment. You know, uh, uh, I, I appreciate uh, your, um, your your faithful participation in our uh, online church, Church of the Eternally Secure. I, I greatly appreciate what, everything you're doing there. Uh, but, you know, uh, among all of us, we're not always in 
perfect agreement on everything. And, and yeah. one thing that there is a disagreement is the subject that you just brought up is uh, if you did get saved as a child, um, you're putting forth the idea and I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I'm, I'm in this side of this particular debate and that uh, a person can get saved and then uh, either backslide and either lose their faith or um, uh, there seems to be no indication they have any interest in Jesus or the Bible, or Christianity anymore. And, and but they were they were saved, they, they, but they've lost their faith and uh, they don't practice their faith in any way. Uh, but then there are uh, friends of ours that say, no, you've, that's impossible. If someone truly gets saved, it's impossible for them to lose their faith and all that. So uh, you're putting forth the idea that you think you are saved when you're a child. But you were backslidden, I would, I guess you'd call it, for lack of any better word. Um, and I, I don't know who, who can say if you got saved as a child or eleven years right. ago. But I'm, I'm here to agree with you that it is possible, and sometimes maybe it's even likely that you were saved as a child, and then you became the prodigal child and got in the pig's pen. Right. And, and then, but then uh, God was always there with open arms waiting for you all the time. God never turned his back on you. Nope, sure didn't. Uh, so uh, uh, who can say if you were saved at, at, uh, as a child or 11 years ago, but uh, I do think that there is such a thing as um, uh, a saved non-believer. Church has destroyed my faith. That sounds like an a, a absurd oxymoron contradiction you know but i i believe that people they can get saved and then they can no longer believe at some point but if they did get saved obviously we all agree that they they can't lose their salvation right. so they must be saved but no longer believing right and that's my position there are some people who no longer believe but they got saved and there are some people the scriptures say that they were never really part of us in the first place right who are we to judge? I right, we don't have on that just a little bit. Who are we to judge of whether they are the the backslider uh, that that uh, they got saved, but now they are the backslidden, or or if they never truly got saved? Why should we be right. judging that? This is why I said that because as a child, I always knew I was going to heaven because of what Jesus did. Churches destroyed my faith. Churches destroyed my faith. Because they, when I would go to church, you know, try seeking, they were telling me I had to get, I had all this sin, sin burden on myself. I had to do it. You have to stop doing these things in order to be saved. And I didn't understand it because I thought Jesus had died for me. I thought he paid the price. And I knew I didn't want to do those sins anymore. But every time I tried to stop using, I got violently ill. I was even hospitalized from withdrawal before. And so I needed help. What happened is eventually I came back to the true faith and got, and God made a way for me to get physical help. And then I it slowly, I'm not doing that anymore. But they should have, you know, I, 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 and another thing is I could always feel God. Like I always, I could never leave him fully. Like I knew Jesus was so good and I just didn't understand I didn't have my doctrine. I, I wasn't reading the Bible. I just grew up knowing that Jesus had saved me and that's why I was going to heaven. And he showed up in my life. If I can retrospectively look back, I can see all these places. I even had a junkie come up to my car one time when I was copping dope. Tell me Jesus is with you. You have angels and just walk away. And so uh, and I clearly heard his voice when I opened the conversations with God book. That's not me. Even though it was saying, I love you. There is no hell. I I knew it wasn't him. It was everything I wanted to hear, but I knew it wasn't my God. So it doesn't matter whether I was saved then and just came back or not, because I believe God knows the end from the beginning. And he knew I was his, whether it was technically done back then or done 11 years ago when my son was born. It doesn't matter because God knew I'd be his and he kept me. So um, I just didn't want anybody. That's 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 the heart I have for people for this, because I know the 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 hopelessness of being bound in sin and then having a pastor tell you 
the burden of sin is on yourself. And until you overcome all those sins, you can't be saved. And that is the most satanic false doctrine on the planet. Uh, we come to Christ just as we are. He, he loved me in my mess as much as he loves me now. And he knows that uh, we are working. Pro this flesh is never perfected. People forget the old man isn't perfected, but he gives us the spirit to help us overcome that flesh. That's why he's constantly telling us to know who we are in Jesus so that we live in the new man, not the old. The uh, You are um, inspired by God. I have no doubt uh, that the Holy Spirit's inspiring you and you can't help but preach. Every time you open your mouth, <laughs> Your, your, in, your inclination is your natural instincts take you into preaching, uh, and, and that's that's wonderful. We we can never get too much preaching, but I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you sometimes no, just, just so I can get back to your. This is all about yeah. you and Jesus, just you and Jesus. <laughs> uh, we want to know, get to know you better and how you got to know Jesus. But uh, so the idea that uh, someone can be saved as a child, Jesus uh, gives us a perfect example when he talks about uh, to be like a little child. And uh, little children do not have a lot of, um, um, they haven't gained a high level of education. Right. They haven't become scholars. You couldn't call them theologians uh, for the most part, except for Jesus in the temple when he was 12, you know. Right. <laughs> but most little, most little kids, you can't say that about them. And so if, if Jesus is correct, as we know he is, that uh, we can be saved by uh, like a little child with this simple childlike faith, like Jesus says, just take my hand, trust me. And the child takes his hand. I, I, I believe that. And I taught that. I've got myself in trouble with some people because they say that uh, I, I'm giving um, too much, um, 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 making it, I guess, too easy. In other words, oh, obviously, we, 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 we're all in, most of us are in agreement that you don't have to do any religious works to be saved. But how much work in, in study of theology is required? That's the question. Right. How much does a person have to learn and, 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 and agree to and say amen to that, amen to that, amen to that? I've, we posed this question in one of our recent discussions, too. How many of these things does a person have to understand? And I've always been on, under the camp that they have to know really very, very little. They just have to have the heart where they understand that they need Jesus to be their savior. They don't have to know everything about him. They don't have to know the, the, everything he's done. They just need to know that they have this need and they have to rely on him. And, and now, of course, you know that I'm going to always tell them all the details. I'm going to tell them like a, a 10, 20 step process of everything I can about Jesus and what he's done. I want them to understand. But I've always believed that the person who may not have all those their facts straight still just by simple childlike faith in, in Jesus to be their savior, that Jesus is not going to reject them because they didn't study enough yet. Uh, so <clears throat> let's move on now. So let's assume you would say saved as a child, possibly in your, your backslidden. And then at some point uh, you decide you get this interest in the Bible and you'll come to this realization of the do the real gospel. When and how did that happen? Well, when I, I came out here, I was in pretty, pretty bad shape. Um, and I had to live with family. I couldn't, I was just disabled and it took a while for me to, uh, get help and healing, but I got, I had my son, uh, I went to high school with a guy. I've known him my whole life and we were just friends, but we ended up seeing each other when I moved back. And so I, I have my son and my whole world changed. And I thought I'm responsible for not only his life, but his religious and spiritual guidance. I better get straight. And my son's grandma, very clear on the real gospel, very clear. She, she wouldn't argue. She wouldn't preach. She just talked about how good Jesus was and how glorious the unspeakable gift is that we have. So great a salvation. And of course, me with my big mouth arguing, well, how come this and how come that? And she would always just bring me back to the love of Christ. And so I decided I'm going to check it out. This was all pride, by the way. I'm going to research and see if that's true. You know, I've got to check everything out. So then I started reading the Bible and it says faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
So spending time in scripture gave me a hunger for more scripture because I was finding amazing things. And I also had, I want to give this guy credit. He was a famous actor in the 80s. His name's Craig Wasson. And he's hardcore born again Christian. He was in that movie, A Body Double with Melanie Griffith back in the 80s. And he had some really dirty dealings that uh, an agent basically bought his contract, got him and shelved him so the other star that was competing with him could be famous. So they put him and destroyed his career. They only signed him so they could keep him down. So he had a really, it was terrible. But he's the one that brought me that Chuck Missler thing from Adam to Noah and said, see, even the Old Testament, the gospel's hidden in the Old Testament. Look, the Bible is really supernatural. Oh, that's all he had to say. It's a supernatural book. Now I got to find this stuff. And I was finding prophecies about Jesus revealed. Then I had to figure out the mathematical possibility of that just being an accident. And then I would look and see how specific, like it's not just Bethlehem, it's Bethlehem Afrenta. There's two, but he told you the exact town. There's two Bethlehems. He told you specifically which town Jesus would be born in. And I just started going, this has got to be from God. He's the only one that knows the future. And if that stuff came to pass and there's all this future stuff that's going to happen, I better check out the prophecies and find out what's going on so I can know where we are, you know? And so I started looking into the prophetic and what nations are going to come against what nations and it's falling right into place. I became fascinated with it, but a hunger began to grow in me. I, I no longer, you know, basically I used to say sometimes God has to empty your cup of everything so he can fill it. And he took everything I thought I was living for and made it either inaccessible or unimportant to me. My career, my whatever. Uh, I, I had it all. And I'll tell you, I was on my way to death. It doesn't fix you. I told uh, my viewers that, you know, they don't tell you when you get to the top, there's nothing up there. You know, you're just left empty inside and you're seeking. And I know that's why so many celebrity friends that I've had have died. It's empty, you know, and uh, so they're trying to fill it with other stuff and you just can't get enough. The hole just eats it up. Um, so, it, I mean, it really everything was stripped for me and it was just my son. Cause I'm, I'm at this point, I'm literally unable to walk. I'm basically, and cause I also lost part of my right arm. So I had a machine on the arm almost a year and I couldn't walk. So I'm basically stuck. And it was, I spent all of my time studying scripture, studying scripture. That, that was my life talking to God. I mean, my son, I talked to him out loud so much that my son knew when I was talking to him and when I was talking to the Lord, he didn't even answer because he knew I was talking to Jesus. If somebody walked in, they'd think I was crazy, but that's what happened. I was so hungry for it. And then I, uh, when I started this channel, I actually didn't make a video until like two years ago, but it was because it was almost like the words were coming out of the page. Cause I had gone to God and said, I really have a heart. I want, I want to, you know, serve you. And I wanted to go to seminary and I could, it, it was like, I could hear an invisible person yelling. Oh no, no. And I was like, well, he doesn't want me to go. He doesn't want me to serve, you know, but that wasn't true. Now I know it's because I would have been taught error. Let him teach me. Let him teach me. Now I check everything with one or two mature men of God. If I see something in scripture and I think I've seen something new, I take it to them because, you know, iron sharpens iron. We're supposed to do that. So it's scripture first. And then I go to men of God that I know are Holy Spirit filled and check with them to see if they can see it too. If they haven't seen it yet, if they can see it or, you know, if I'm in the wrong context. And it just, mm -hmm. That gets me to a, um, a question I was uh, uh, wanted to ask you. You walked right into this. The the it sounds to me like you you were uh, intrigued by this claim that the Bible is supernatural. Mm -hmm. You kind of took the bait and started studying it. Now, when you you said you started studying it, I'm assuming that you were studying it without. Uh, watching videos and reading uh, uh, extra biblical writings and books because yep. there's a lot of really good apologetics teachers mm -hmm. that uh, they talk about 
the bright Bethlehem, and they talk about the mathematical probabilities. These things are in some great apologetics books that are available, mm -hmm. and a lot of people have benefited from that. But you, are you saying then that you uh, were look in the scriptures and you came to some of these conclusions on your own yes. without extra biblical uh, yes. writings aiding you? I was spending all of my time in scripture. I had my son's aunt knows this. I had a little notebook. I would write everything. Stuff would come up. First would pop up. And then another verse, I mean, what do they got to do with each other? I had no idea. It was almost like I was being fed information. And so I'd go to scripture and go, whoa, this was a shadow of that. This, and you'll see on some of my videos, I do Old Testament shadows. You know, like one day I was sitting on the chair and I, I almost lost my breath because I saw that the ram caught by the horns, by the thicket, was Jesus's crown of thorns. He was caught with the, you know, the thorns in his, and I couldn't get, I couldn't catch my breath. Like I, I know that the tree that was put in the bitter waters of Mara is the cross, the wood of the cross, because it made the bitter waters sweet. I know that the rock Moses struck to bring water out is Jesus. He's the rock from which living water flows. I could see it. I could see him everywhere. It's like somebody opened my eyes to scripture and I could see it. And, and that's why I, I so badly want people to get it. I'm like, I just want you to see. And now I know when he said, if they have eyes to see, let them see. If they have ears to hear, let them hear. They don't have spiritual ears sometimes. And like you said the other night, you know, if our gospel be hid, it be hid to them that are lost. Satan's blinded them and we can't make them see it. And it's not by wisdom of words. It's only by the word of God. So when somebody's that far into error, all I can do is I can try to explain a little, but I usually just give them scripture. Because faith come by here and here by the word of God. It's the only way, I think, to get through that barrier. Yeah, I find that very interesting. And, and, I, and I don't want to say unique. Uh, I'm sure other people uh, had this kind of uh, growth experience, uh, this pattern that you described there of learning. But um, many people are, are more like, in, in my case, uh, right after I, I started reading the Bible, I got saved. By, as I'm reading the Gospel of John, uh, and then every, my, all my interests changed, and I found a radio program called the Bible Answer Man Show. Mm. Uh, Dr. Walter Martin hosted it. I heard of that. I never heard of that. Years. And it was live, and I'd listen to it every day on my way to work, and then I started ordering all of his audio tapes, mm. and I got his book, the Kingdom of the Cults, because it, it compared – true biblical Christianity to the cults, you know, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and all Catholicism and everything else. So, so you can recognize the counterfeits, you know, the flaws in, there, in them. And that was wonderful. Looking back on it now, uh, I'm grateful to Walter Martin uh, for, for helping me with my foundation. Mm -hmm. But at some of the things I learned from him, I, 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 my conclusion now is I'm not not necessarily in agreement on all these things right. on everything, but but on the most important essential things, uh, I had I was grounded well. And then a friend of mine went to prison, and he left me all of his uh, books by um, Dr. Peter Ruckman. Right. And uh, he uh, he's famous for being like the king of the KJV only movement, mm -hmm. and uh, and also promoting the. Uh, the, the dispensational futurism of view, viewpoint uh, of eschatology. And uh, so I got uh, from his, his books, uh, I, I got that viewpoint kind of drilled in my head with all that. But what I found out was eventually when I started que questioning whether, hey, uh, were they necessary? They're my teachers. There's, I'm, I'm grateful. But could it, is it possible they may have been wrong on anything? I had to go back and examine and to see, hey, did I get taught correctly on everything? Because I found out there's other viewpoints. This is not the only way people uh, come down on these questions. So there's most theological questions, there's at least two answers, and there may maybe three or four different answers, possible answers. So when I started doing that and searching the scriptures on my own to see if what I would learn was correct, Right. I concluded that a few things I learned from my teachers, uh, I've I've moved away. I from. set up for five forty-five. I'm yeah. so sorry. Yeah. How much more time do you have left? About Fifteen minutes. Okay. Uh, 
But what I'm doing is just con contrast. I want to contrast. Okay. <laughs> Orange. So sorry about that, Luke. Right. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, it's interesting to me in contrasting your learning experience to mine, it seems like they're, they're completely opposite in that, in that I, I learned from extra biblical writings and then I went back and, and weeded out the things that uh, I thought the Bible doesn't really agree with that. So I changed my views on a few, few things. But you went to learn from the scriptures. You saw a lot of things in it on your own. And then have you have you looked at uh, any of these extra biblical uh, writings or teachers that are these scholars that maybe sometimes maybe they are, uh, they specialize in a particularly niche of yes. Christianity? Have you studied some of that too now to, to see how yes. your views compare with theirs? This this is why I had to go off on my own because I would watch the TV programs and five different preachers would say five different things. And I was I couldn't get to the truth. I didn't know who to believe, Luke. And and so I, I couldn't. I just couldn't until I got it straight, like I knew what salvation was. Then I could look for a pastor. And say, wait a minute, is he on the right foundation? Because only if he believes in Christ alone, only if he, like I know Jenison and Franklin, Charles Stanley, they believe in the finished work of Christ. Now, a lot of them, a lot of the Calvinists, Ray Comfort, John MacArthur, Paul Washer, they all say it's grace through faith. But when you hear they're preaching, they're really preaching works. And if they're not preaching overt works, like you got to do this, they're backloading them. So either way, you're looking to yourself to either get, keep, or confirm salvation. So once I got the gospel straight and I knew the Holy Spirit was guiding me, I would look for pastors and teachers that I knew were on the correct foundation. Then I would listen to what they'd say. I wouldn't take it as all truth. I would find out what they said and I would go check my scripture and then I would check it against context and I would see if what they said was true. So I have learned since then, but to get to the original place, I had to do it on my own. There were so many pre, I remember standing in my living room screaming, well then who can stand? If that's the standard God, I'm lost. Every, everybody's lost. Everybody's going to hell. Cause I don't know anybody that stopped all their sins. And then I started researching why, why are they coming up with this repent of your sins nonsense? It's nowhere in the King James Bible. But then I found the word repent. And I was like, well, it doesn't say repent of your sins. You can repent of anything. It means to rethink. Re is in again. And pent is in pensar in Spanish or pensive to think. It just means rethink. So I went through and found that God repents almost 40 times. He can't mean to turn from sin. And so I finally got some clarity on where they were getting this nonsense from by redefining words. But I did, I, I do look at some pastors, uh, like I love Ralph Yankee Arnold. There's a few eschatology things I, I don't agree with. Uh, but see, I, I, all, I'm always seeking. I want the full counsel of God. I'll look in the old and if I'm thinking on a subject, I'll find every verse that's related to that subject and try to see the whole thing and check each one in context. And I've been beaten up for it, for just saying I'm in the middle of trying to see through other people's eyes. If somebody I love says, hey, I think this, this might not be accurate. I think tradition may be wrong on this then I'm going to go, okay, I respect this person. I'm going to go research it for myself. And that's where I am right now on a couple of things. But unfortunately, many beloved people that, uh, you know, have, have abandoned me because I've been honest about wanting to see through the eyes of others. It doesn't mean that I'm going to agree, but I think it's right. I think we should reason together and have iron sharpen iron. And listen to one another because I don't know everything. I need to keep it open. And I found that a lot of doctrines that the modern church has didn't even exist until like 400, 500 AD with the Catholics. Augustine is, is at the root of a lot of it. And there's a lot of unbiblical things that he came up with. Nobody even uh, mentioned some of these doctrines, you know, I don't want to get into them. It's a whole different thing, but you know, 
the the whole thing is is I believe that God will bring us to all truth. And early you were saying whether you know you were saved as a child or whatever. I believe if somebody falls away from their faith and they live like he's gonna bring them back to truth. I do. I, I think he'll always uh go out and get his children. Remember, he talks about the sheep. I'll go out, I'll chase it and find it and put it over my shoulders and bring it back to the fold. You know, I don't think people people really rely on themselves and their own faithfulness too much instead of just trusting that if they do fall into error, because there's a lot of fear. If I fall away or I believe wrong, am I going to lose salvation? Trust that God's going to keep you. Whatever work he started in, he's going to keep it. You know, I really think we focus on us too much when he promises as his kids that he's going to make sure we have what we need and we're going to get to the right place. And uh, I, I really hope more people look to God, look to Jesus instead of themselves. And I, I want people to have that peace because I know the torment, Luke. I, have, I, need the torment. I have a lot of videos that are an hour and two hours long, but I, I also have a quite a collection of videos that I've made. They're uh, five, 10, 15 minutes long. I, I call it my, my short, short videos. Right. <laughs> One of them was called let's stay focused on Jesus. And, and really that's the heart of the whole issue. And, and you know, stop, as you as you just related that it's it's not about ourselves it's about him just if we just keep that in mind it solves an awful lot of problems it does. but these problems here the problems we're dealing with in the church now none of this is is a really brand new uh you you can see in uh, the new testament uh a lot of these problems are various uh false teachings that are being argued against throughout the, the, the epistles and even in uh, the gospel accounts, you can see them some of these false teachings. Being uh, and then you get uh, uh, after the apostles have all died away, you have an era called the church fathers in the say second century. And it, I've studied that extensively. And I'll tell you, the church fathers did not do us any service. They no. They moved us from faith alone into believing in sacraments and water. Yes, yes. Communion and all this stuff. Um, and then, as uh, you said, some of these errors came in like the fifth century. Well, guess what? There are some teachings that are so new. It's the middle of the 19th century when wow. people came up with some, some ideas that are popular today. So I do think that we ought to be willing to study everything and, and, and uh, test it by the scriptures um and not be closed-minded about it but uh, the answers really are in the bible and the, and we can find all the true answers right there uh right but we shouldn't rule out being able to learn from scholars sure. theologians fellow believers and so on uh how many more minutes do you have left here getting close to your to exit time huh yeah I, i'm gonna have to go in just a minute i'm so sorry i just i have church on wednesday night and and by the way, my pastor and I don't agree on everything. He's, he, he thinks that the wine was just fruit juice. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Well, I have a, here's a question then to, to finish up on. Is that uh, uh, I, I've said that the, the biggest problem within the true church is uh, dogmatism. Uh, among those people who understand the gospel, believe the tr true gospel, uh, and, and they, as soon as they start taking Christianity very seriously, they start becoming dogmatic about right. you know five or ten different different theological subjects, and they're just adamant. You, they're they're absolutely right, and you better agree with them. And that's the biggest problem that I I see. So I made a video titled "Test for Dogmatism," and I said if we made a question a, a, a true false question a test, and let's say we had twenty questions on it, true or false, on twenty different theological subjects. And then we asked everybody we know on YouTube to check, go through there privately, true, false, true, false, all, all the way through. You're not going to find any two people that nope. are completely match in all their answers. Right. That's what people don't seem to understand is that none of us really agree on everything. Nope. We, we agree on the essentials that that's, that's the most we can really hope for. And then on the, all the other stuff, we should enjoy listening right. to dissenting yeah. opinions because we might learn that we maybe we're wrong. But they add these non-essentials as if they are essentials. I had one guy that I adored break fellowship because I refused to say it's all God's sovereignty. We have no free will as far as salvation. It's election. He just chooses any, many, money mo. 
And, you know, it's it's his mercy that he even saves some. And so when it, I'm like, well, whosoever will. And Jesus said I would have done it, but you would not. I mean, and it, if we're judged, we can't. We, well, you made me not to believe. You made me and chose me to not believe in you. That doesn't, it doesn't, I think it's that God is so outside of our time and above our ways that you can't just put it here that it's all his sovereignty or it's only free. I think it's a mixture of his foreknowledge because it does say according to the foreknowledge of the father. Right. So, I mean, he literally broke fellowship and made a non-essential essential. Yeah. You, know, you must believe this or you're not a real Christian. Yeah. I, um, uh, I have a series on Calvinism debunked uh, probably six, eight hours of teachings refuting all aspects, all components of Calvinism. But the part of it that really bothers me the most is uh, the sovereignty free will issue. And what Calvinists do, and they, I don't think they realize it. And I think that the people on the side of eternal torture for the lost, that they're, they're doing exactly the same thing. And that is that they are making the God of the Bible that I love and know it is the God of love and mercy and justice. They're turning him to an evil, sadistic tyrant. He won't say, allow some people to be saved because he's sovereign and he's choosing and they you have nothing to say about it. That's evil. Yeah. For God to, for God to uh, if think like that, God would be evil. And, and then to, to also teach or believe that Jesus, I'll say, put it, let's, let's tell, call Jesus because most people can relate to him. I relate to him more, more right. personally. Right. And, and I can't imagine Jesus personally or even condoning the torture of another person, particularly torturing them in torment forever and ever. That's evil. So when these people start, um, uh, I don't think they thought it through to realize that they're making our God of love and mercy into some evil, sadistic torturer who won't even allow people to choose to be believe if they, if they don't have the right to choose. Right. The election thing is, uh, well, John Calvin was a wicked man. He was a terrible man. And I, I don't know why people call their faith after a man anyway, even if he was a good man. Calvin didn't die for you. It should be, you know, Christ Christism or something, not Calvinism. And it, that that's what happens when people take God's word and use man's wisdom and try to figure out God and how his mind works. And they come up with stuff like this. And, uh, you know, that's why I, I really didn't listen to anybody for a long time. But now I do. I just got to make sure they meet the criteria. Like I interviewed my pastor for almost an hour and he told his wife, that woman knows what she believes. She put me through the ringer. I wasn't going to go to a church that's going to, you know, and he's very preaches hard against sin. You know, sometimes I think he focuses too much on it instead of just our freedom in Christ so we can live in joy because strength of sin is the law. He does a lot of, you know, law preaching, but he knows Jesus does and keeps you saved. He, he does all the saving and keeping you saved. So it's hard to find a church where, like you said, we're going to agree on these things. But I think we need to show some grace and compassion and open mindedness. Like you said, the dogmatism is, is I, I, it's so hard. They, they won't open their minds that maybe this one thing they might need to research a little bit. They might need to just open their mind. And, and even if you can't be convinced or change your mind, at least see why somebody believes like they do. You know, understand why they have come to that conclusion. And then you can relate to them as a brother or sister. Yeah. That's what I think is missing. Yeah. There is no love or grace in the so-called Christian community. I've had the worst, cruelest things I've ever heard said to me by so those proclaiming Christ. You know, Gandhi said, I love Christ, but I don't like those Christians. Yeah. Yeah, I, I made a couple of short videos that did not make me popular at all. One <laughs> other, uh, why, why most Christians make me sick. Right. Another one was uh, top five reasons people reject Christianity. Mm, oh, I got to see that one. I didn't see that one. Yeah, this is the these are the reasons that these are the things that we deal with every day. We we experience this every day. And it's, it's sad because some people they'll never 
they basically conclude if that's what a Christian is, I, I never want to be one. Amen. All right. Amen. Okay, sister, I know you got to go. Uh, yeah, I love the, you. And we can do a part two if you have more questions or you just want to chat. Yeah. Okay. We've got some stuff. I'm so sorry I had to rush. That's good. And I know that not only myself, but but hundreds or thousands of people really appreciate and value your, your ministry on YouTube. So be encouraged. Thank Bless you. Bless you, sister. I love you. Bye.